Hi, everyone. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. Today's episode is inspired by a terrific webinar I watched on Sunday entitled Haiti's Campaign for Dignity, um, featuring Mrs. Mildred Aristide. We are broadcasting today in partnership with one of the webinar's organizers, the Haiti Action Committee, which was founded in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1991. I am joined uh, today in conversation by three members of the Haiti Action Committee, Pierre Lavoisier, Seth Donnelly, and Judith Merk Merkinson. Welcome everybody. So happy to have you with me today. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. So I thank you very you, much. Thank you so much. I have to let the audience know that all three uh, of our guests today are such an inspiration for me and people that um, I have worked with um, over the years uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So it's a real honor to have the three of you here. So Pierre, um, I'm gonna ask all three of you to just give a, a brief introduction of yourselves to our audience and, and your role with Haiti Action Committee and then we can, we can start our broader conversation. So Pierre, let's start with you. Yes, Pierre Labossiere, originally from Haiti, moved to the US when I was a teenager. And, um, and I moved to the Bay Area in 81. And uh, we've been in contact with the grassroots movement in Haiti um, way before that being formed there. And uh, what they asked us to do, they asked us to have a supporting uh, an organization that would be in solidarity with the grassroots struggle in Haiti. And that's what we've been doing since our founding in 1991. And can you tell us just a little bit what, when you say grassroots struggle, what, what should our audience know about that? What is, exactly does that mean for, for you and the Haitian people? What it means is that um, typically what you've had in Haiti is an, it's a domination of the, of the discourse by a tiny elite. And they are the ones who usually, they speak French, they project themselves outside of Haiti, and the needs of the, of the men and women, the overwhelming majority, are not mentioned. Their concerns, the exploitation that they suffer is not mentioned. So we are talking about the peasants, the workers, the, the many who are so exploited, students who, for the most part, are overwhelmingly poor. They are the ones who have taken to the streets to demand their rights, to demand equality, to demand justice. And so that's what I mean when I say grassroots. I'm talking about the overwhelming majority of the population of Haiti that wants to see a change. What we say here, the 99%. That's correct. And that's what we say also in Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Seth, welcome to today's program. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about your role with the Haiti Action Committee. So I, I joined the Haiti Action Committee in the summer of 2004 um, after the coup. Uh, the, the, the preceding February, February 29, 2004, there was the violent coup um, against President Aristide and uh, backed by the United States, um, U.S. government. Um, and there was a need to have a fact-finding delegation in on the ground in Haiti that summer to try to get start getting into the prisons and look, uh, get documentation on what was happening with political prisoners. And so a dear friend of mine was already in Haiti Action. He recruited me and I went down with a small team with him and another comrade. Um, and we spent weeks in the, in, in, in the prisons. We were able to gain access and discover the most horrendous conditions of political repression and abuse. Um, that then led towards uh, me becoming a full-fledged member of Haiti Action Committee and going back regularly ever since, um, working with various, continuing the human rights work, but also uh, working with popular grassroots organizations on the ground and taking my high school students um, on 12 different delegations to work with some of these popular grassroots organizations as well and to try to generate support, solidarity with the popular movement, the grassroots movement that Pierre mentioned. That's fascinating. I love that you take students. 
And for our audience, I actually met Seth in Port-au-Prince when our dele two of our dele your delegation, I think it was the last day of yours yeah. and the first day of mine or something to that effect. So yeah. that was very cool. So, and so our, um, our other guest uh, today is Judith Merck Merkinson. Welcome, Merck. Hi. Um, well, I've been an, like an adjunct member of, <laughs> of Haiti Action from the very <laughs> beginning because my partner was one of the founders, Robert Roth. And uh, I've been particularly interested in two areas of work in terms of Haiti. One is the condition of women, and I've written about that. Uh, especially in terms of the issues both of women organizing and overcoming sexual violence in Haiti and the impact of the, uh, the United Nations and the impact of militarization on Haiti and then the organizing of grassroots women. And the other um, aspect has been around human rights and especially charting the impact of the combination of militarization and the impact of US intervention and on Haiti. And last year, actually, Seth and I wrote a report, uh, me from the National Lawyers Guild and Seth from Haiti Action on the human rights crisis in Haiti, specifically focusing on a massacre that happened in a neighborhood called La Saline. So we're continuing to do that. And the other aspect is also to understand the role of the Aristide Foundation and UNIFA and how important it is to support uh, these efforts. Because I think one of the things is that a lot of times when people think about Haiti, if they think about it at all, it's like, oh, it's such a mess. It's so terrible. Nothing can be done. And I think what UNIFA shows, as well as the grassroots movement, is that there's a vibrant organizing going on in Haiti. And it goes from grassroots people in the markets and women in the markets all the way up to the university level. And I think the other thing I would say is that right now, when we're really focusing on white supremacy and racism in this country, we have to pay attention to what's going on in Haiti. And I think we haven't really done the best job of that. We haven't, and I, I mean, this is what is such the so why it's such a pleasure for for all three of you to be here today, because Haiti was the first, the first rebellion, the first, the first people to 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 throw off the yoke of slavery, and and we so seldom talk about it. We don't talk about it enough, and that that lies on on all of us. So. And I, I, this whole context of Black Lives Matter, yeah, we, we should be taking our lead from Haiti. You said something, Merck, just a moment ago uh, regarding Haiti, if they think about it at all. And it's that awareness, and I hope that's what we can get across to our, our audience today, is to think about it and to think about it a whole lot more. Um, one of the things that well, I mentioned when we introduced the program that I was really inspired by Sunday's um, webinar that Haiti Action Committee organized in, um, in partnership with the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, I believe. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was a webinar on the, uni on the uh, University Foundation Autospeed. And I wonder if um, we can talk about the significance of that university, its, its, found, its founding principles, and its early history. And then let's talk about um, the need for its expansion today. But can we talk? Yeah, get a, what, what, yeah go ahead. I'm sorry. But, yeah. One of the things about the university, it's a great source of pride for Haitians because it's it represents what, what we as a people can accomplish in spite of the fact that they have shut it down. When I say they, I'm talking about the special forces from the US, France, and Canada when they came in during the coup d'etat of 2004, February 29, 2004, that killed over 10,000 people. 
And the uh, first thing that the, the invading troops did, they went to the university, shut it down. Now the university had just opened and its mission, it had 240 students, half men, half women, half young, the student body. And recruited from various communities in Haiti that traditionally wouldn't see their children having access to schools because they are excluded from participating, the majority population is excluded. It's a very elitist society. Society, And so the, um, the students, to us, the, to see when President Aristide returned to Haiti in 2011, now the students, I'm sorry, let me go back to the coup. The, the university was shut down, the students were kicked out, and it was turned into a military barracks to house the troops of the US and later on the troops of the UN. Now imagine that, a university that's training doctors and nurses, which the country desperately needs, being shut down to house men with guns who are repressing the population. Fortunately, a number of these students did go to Cuba and finish their schooling and they have returned to Haiti, quite a few of them. And they are the ones who are there right now working with the population. So to us, it's, a, it's from this, when President Aristide returned in 2011, President Aristide and his wife Mildred, they vowed to reopen the university. And they have reopened it. And since then, the university has, in the past three years, has graduated over 230 doctors, uh, quite a number of nurses and, and attorneys who are providing service to the population. What this shows is that in spite of all the repression, in spite of everything else that they are doing to repress the population, here is this hope rising for the people of Haiti, uh, uh, providing our young people with a venue so that they can learn and be technical skills and be of service to the broader community. So it's something that has, and I've received since the webinar, I've received so many calls from Haitians who had heard about it, were very proud of it, but didn't know the details which me, Mrs. Mildred Aristide has provided to the people and people are just exploding with joy and a sense of, yes, we can do it. Well, I think this is so exciting because um, as we were all talking about be, um, beforehand that there is so much news and justifiably so, um, coming out of Cuba with, you know, a focus on, on their healthcare system and the medical brigades that they are providing um, across the world to combat COVID-19. But this university and this story in Haiti is so important and I'm so happy we have an opportunity to raise it up as another example of what's possible um, within, uh, with a Caribbean island nation. And so I wonder, um, for our audience, if, if one of you can give us just a, a very brief history of what actually happened in 2004. And the reason I ask is because we're seeing a lot of similar activities, um, particularly in the last year, um, across, the hemis across the hemisphere. But if our audience could just understand the coup in 2004, and the need and RSD returning in 2011. And then let's also talk about um, the uprisings in Haiti in early 2019, which got very little coverage, although those uprisings following in Ecuador, Chile, and later in the year in Bolivia got a lot of, a lot of press coverage. But let's have a brief, a, a brief history of what happened in 2004, because it's so important to things we're seeing today. Well, the, the, the coup um, is very similar to other uh, coups the U.S. has staged since. In fact, what the U.S. did in Haiti was, in a sense, a, uh, uh, an example of what a later iteration would be what they did in Honduras. Um, um, in, in, with the coup against President Aristide, the, um, at the time, the, the Bush administration cut off uh, loans and aid. Um, they, uh, they carried out an economic war, similar to what they did, um, what the Nixon administration did against Allende. 
uh, in Chile, um, the U.S. Um, the U.S. pumped millions of dollars into a bogus um, elite right-wing opposition called the, the Group of 184 um, that didn't really have any, it had no legitimate popular support on the ground in Haiti, but the U.S. pumped taxpayer dollars into that opposition, uh, working with, uh, for example, sweatshop owner um, Bulos, who was part of that coup. Um, and then there was a paramilitary component where the United States government was was weaponizing and supporting paramilitary counter-type terror units, such as the one led by Guy Philippe that would come in from the Dominican Republic and terrorize the people of Haiti. So it was a three-pronged coup. And even though the vast majority of the population remained in support of President Aristide, as demonstrations towards the very end continued to show, um, the U.S. was able to really create a huge amount of chaos. But what finally did it in was the U.S. government kidnapped President Aristide and his wife Mildred um, and put them on a, mil a U.S. military plane and flew them out of the country against their will. Uh, Sounds exactly like Honduras. February 29, 2004, and, and took them to uh, Central Africa, African Republic. Um, against, and that's well documented that that was a kidnapping. One of the best sources on that uh, is a book by Randall Robbins, uh, um, Robinson, An Unbroken Agony. Um, but there's many folks who documented this uh, kidnapping that um, they literally had to remove President Aristide and Mil First Lady Mildred Aristide by force out of the country. Um, when I was with students a few years ago, we went to UNIFA and we met with uh, Mildred Aristide. She sat with us for about three hours and gave us a blow by blow account of of that horrible night, as well as um, the, the events leading up to the coup. And we also were able to see, going back to your earlier question, Terry, just what, um, despite the coup and despite all this repression since, UNIFA, my, the students, my students were blown away by UNIFA. Uh, they've never seen an institution like that where there was so much motivation with some of the poorest kids in Haiti or young adults in Haiti participating in these programs to become the future doctors and engineers and lawyers. And we were able to see classes in session. Later, uh, Merck and I were able to go see a graduation of UNIFA in March 2018. And I've, I, as a teacher, having seen too many graduations at this point, I've never seen a graduation as, as inspiring as what I've seen at UNIFA, where the, the oath of, for example, of the students, the future doctors, is to serve the people. Um, so the coup um, was extremely violent. The repression was massive. But despite that, UNIFA um, remains this incredible flagship of hope. It's a really inspiring, really inspiring story. So in 2011, the Aristides returned to Haiti. They returned, I would say, the one thing I would add to the issue about 2004 is that when the revolution happened in Haiti in 1804, the Haitian people were forced to pay reparations to France. I mean, we're talking, this is completely obscene. The, the enslaved people had to pay their slave masters because it was so, they made so much money. It was their richest colony of France. And the money that they had to pay bankrupted the country and, and it took it until the 20th century for them to pay it off. And when Aristide in 2003 and 2004 began to say to France, you know, you owe us that money. And, and it, in US, in current dollars, it was $21 billion, $700 million that were owed. And it was sort of like, that was the icing on the cake. And uh, subsequently the coup happened. And the other thing about the coup is they did what they're doing in Venezuela and other countries where they're saying they're, they're putting up all these um, like human rights uh, accusations. And unfortunately, uh, as often happens, human rights organizations working in the United States, such as Amnesty or Human Rights Watch, actually went along with it. So that didn't help the situation. But mostly it was because uh, Haiti represents something. Um, it's not just the money 
which is important, but it represents, you know, a spirit of, of black liberation. And the United States has never, from Thomas Jefferson on up, has never been able to tolerate that. It's a really powerful, uh, I'll just share with all of you in the audience too, the, the, the two times I've been to Haiti, it's a profound experience. And, and I say this to you here, and you and your, your heritage and your people and your ancestry, it's a very profound experience to be among the Haitian people, particularly in their country where there is such an absence of public infrastructure and institutions and just the constant um, intervention to prevent a lot of that from coming and yet the people, the Haitian people are so profoundly beautiful inside and out. The dignity that comes with that notable history from 1804 is so profound and I would love for everyone here in the mainland United States to see what that, what that dignity, it's just so beautiful, it radiates inside and out of the Haitian people. So Pierre, that is, um, that's what you and, and yes. your country represent to, to me, is that. And it's something I wish everyone could see and experience. Thank you very much. I, I just want to also highlight the fact that um, Haiti came together as a result of, the, of this massive uprising by the enslaved Africans. But um, we didn't, our foremothers and forefathers, because women were in the leadership of that struggle. There was a man, Bookman Dotti, who, who presided over the ceremony, the planning, the Congress, really, of the enslaved leaders, of the leaders of the enslaved population. But there was also a woman, Cecile Fatima. And she and Bookman, they co-presided over it, over that, that massive rebellion. But one success was achieved 13 years later in 1804, the Declaration of Independence. Haiti's foreign policy was aimed at overthrowing slavery, the destruction of slavery, and supporting brothers and sisters, other people who were struggling for freedom in different parts of the world. And that's how Simon Bolivar came to Haiti, and not just Simon Bolivar, others as well. And Haiti provided him not only sanctuary, but also gave him volunteers, many young men who had fought in the struggle for independence, went with him to Venezuela twice on two occasions and struggled with him. And the only thing Haiti demanded was that slavery would be abolished wherever he was successful. And Haiti led the struggle too in the do present day Dominican Republic, which at the time was a Spanish colony. 1822, Haiti abolished slavery there as well. And uh, so, and Haiti also extended its solidarity to the, to the people of Greece when they were fighting for their independence. And Haiti provided them with support, uh, such as shiploads of coffee, so they could buy themselves the munition, the ammunition and the guns necessary for them to fight their way out of their oppression. And so we've had that spirit of solidarity, and, um, and that's what you experience in Haiti when people welcomed you. So uh, I'll say this, that we look forward to people being in solidarity with us, you know, as we are fighting these, these evils that are oppressing us, and as we are building the country, of which UNIFA is a beautiful example of that rebuilding by the Haitian people themselves. So you, you mentioned um, Simon Bolivar, and Simon Bolivar visited Haiti twice for support for his uh, revolution. And just for, for, our, for our audience, um, in Venezuela, the, the Bolivarian Revolution is named after Simon Bolivar. And um, he is known as the liberator of the Spanish, the northern Spanish colonies in South, in South America. And at that time it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. That's right. and, and Panama was right. sick. Right, six countries. And um, Grand Colombia. Well, that Haitian Venezuela relationship is profound, it has a really significant history and is profound. And you know, Pierre, 
you told me yesterday when I called you to, to participate today, you shared with me a really beautiful story about Simon Bolivar and growing up um, in Haiti under and next to a statue of Simon Bolivar that you grew up with him. Oh. Yes, uh, actually, the first place he landed when he was first defeated by the Spanish, he landed in my hometown of Lecai. And right around where he landed, they had built a statue. And as a kid, it was like living history. I was right, I knew who Simon Bolivar was, and I used to play you know, soccer by the statue, climb fruit trees right by the statue, sat there eating my, the fruits, <laughs> uh, a, a variety of almonds right there. So, but to us living in Haiti, we live the history, we discuss it. For example, what's going on present in, in Haiti today, whatever is going on throughout the world, people of Haiti know this information. They analyze it. They make connections with their own struggles in Haiti. And people feel in solidarity with the world movement for justice, for equality against racism. And, uh, and that's what that story, I was sharing that with you in a way to say that how aware we are of the world, of the struggle taking place in different parts of the world. It's so inspiring. And my understanding is that there are more statues throughout the world of Simon Bolivar than any other historical figure. Is that correct? And you grew up with one of them. There's one in San Francisco too. <laughs> And here in DC. So um, let's go back to 2011 with the return of um, the Aristides to Haiti and their vision for UNIFA and how that was renewed and where and where the um, university is today and what the hope is for its future. That's well, it began, you know, when he came back, they said that uh, their, their biggest project was going to be education. And that, you know, during the Aristide um, administrations, more schools were built than in the entire period leading up to that point. And I think um, Mrs. Aristide said that during his administration, over 16% of the budget went to education and now it's just a tiny little bit. And, and really they see that education, just as, as we know, is one of the foundations for the future. And it's one of the foundations for youth to have a future. And so they began very small. The, it was sort of a mess. Like even now there are still some buildings um, that are uh, that show the impact of the U.S. military being there, but they began very small, and now today, uh, almost ten years later, they have over two thousand students. I think she said twenty two hundred students now are in there. They, as as Pierre said, they've graduated all these different um, doctors, lawyers, nurses physical therapists, which are really important, especially considering what happened during the earthquake. And there are no, there's no school of physical therapy in Haiti. And they also have begun a agriculture school, which as you can imagine, is also very essential. So they have this huge thing going on and it's the most beautiful campus. I wish we had, had brought pictures. And what's interesting about it is that and everything is very well thought out so that when you go there, you know, and you take a tour and it's pointed out to you, oh, we're building this section so that students have a place to sit and just read in the shade. You know, it's very hot in Haiti, you know, and we're building this section so students have a place that, you know, have a meal and and just using there's it's 33 acres. And so part of that 33 acres now is going to be devoted to a teaching hospital. And there aren't very many teaching hospitals and certainly it's very necessary for their students and for the Haitian people to have this incredible hospital, you can imagine, run by the Aristide Foundation. And as Seth said, when they're 
graduating, one of the things they have to pledge to is, which is very different from any graduation, you know, that I've ever been to, um, you have to pledge to be, serve the people and be for human rights and justice. And, you know, we know here in the United States, there aren't many hospitals that are devoted to serving human rights and justice. In fact, I don't know any. Um, but to have one in Haiti in particular, where healthcare, you know, is certainly not a human right and very few people have access to it is, is really incredible. So while we're talking about healthcare as a human right, which is far from the case here in the United States, and we're all discovering this during this COVID-19 pandemic. Can you, um, one or all three of you, touch a bit on um, the COVID-19 impact of the Haitian population and how, how it's impacting the population and what is being done to combat it? I mean, the, the development of this teaching hospital for sure is a vision for, to, to deal with future um, health crises, but what, what's, what's the condition today at this moment? Uh, I can jump in there. I was waiting for Seth to jump in. But, um, <laughs> I was waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so, yeah. okay. Uh, in late March, um, early April, I wrote an article called Resisting COVID-19 in Haiti. And uh, one of the things that what we've seen, and Merck mentioned that, about the healthcare budget back when President Aristide was in office, it was uh, over 16.6% of the national budget was devoted to healthcare. 20% of the budget was devoted towards education, meaning building schools, training centers so people could have trained medical professionals to help them, not only in the field of medicine, but in the various other disciplines that the population needs to, in order to develop and to have quality of life. And so since the coup of 2004, that has been severely reduced, where the budget for, the, for healthcare has been reduced to less than 5% from what Mrs. Aristide from her presentation on the webinar, so what does that mean? It means that many of our medical professionals haven't been getting paid or paid such low amount that it's terrible. The lack of personal protective equipment is something horrendous. In the midst of this, some of the hospitals that were flourishing when President Aristide was in office, very well equipped, providing service to people, many of them have shut down. Either they have shut down or they are completely dysfunctional. Uh, you can see, we've, I've seen videos of women in maternity wards laying on the bare floor and putting their heads on the chair just to, and they are very, you know, pregnant women ready to give birth. Some people have died in front of the hospitals waiting for somebody to let them in or for doctors. And this is really a horrendous situation. So the article is called Resisting COVID-19. So what did the population, what did they have to do? They had to rely on each other. They had to rely on, on uh, traditional medicine to help them uh, through this process because the government was more interested in getting money from the outside world. And, and uh, nobody in Haiti, there's a lack, of, um, a lack of credibility. The government totally is unbelievable. And so many of the statistics are aimed towards the outside world rather than really to help the Haitian population. So people have, are managing with, the, with COVID-19, but they are managing basically by relying on each other, uh, focusing, trying to get uh, the, the traditional medicine to help them. Uh, lack of water, for example, the government comes out with ridiculous stuff about washing, but at the, washing hands. But at the same time, the people lack water. I believe over close to 30% of the population has access to clean running water, clean drinking water. So you can imagine what people, so it's a heroic struggle 
by the grassroots, the overwhelming impoverished grassroots in Haiti are fighting. But with that, I have to say, uh, the, the UNIFA was one of the very early institutions to do a massive campaign of education through Radio Timon uh, to educate the public regarding that particular situation with very few means. And also, they, uh, one of the things that was that impacted their activity in some way was the public clinic the, that they used to have. For example, they would have uh, free public clinics for the population outside uh, on the streets, you know, to or inside the Aristide Foundation. So people would come in and they would help people out, give them medical care, and, and having a chart for each one who they would see. So those are the activities that are going on. However, COVID-19, you know, has forced them to go into a different kind of mode to provide services to the population. And this is why we feel that um, we really urge people to look at the webinar. People can go to HaitiEmergencyRelief.org, HaitiEmergencyRelief.org, and they can and the webinar is post is posted there and people can take a look at it it's a very powerful um webinar with uh, congresswoman maxine waters danny glover uh with dr henry ford haitian american doctor who was provided so much uh, help and support to haiti um ira kersben attorney ira kersben civil rights immigration attorney a young woman leader uh, president of foothill college um, Black Student Union, Keona Harmon, and of course, Mrs. Mildred Aristide, who gave the keynote, and just phenomenal. And so I urge people to go on the Haiti Emergency Relief.org to check that out. And, uh, and we also, we know times are hard, but if people can, make a donation. There's a donate button. People can donate whatever they have, and this will be of great help to help build that hospital and to help UNIFA and um, provide help our brothers and sisters in Haiti. It's a fantastic project and the webinar was so inspiring and that's why I invited all of you here today. <laughs> I was so inspired as well. Um, so for the three of you, I know I promised all of you, you know, 30, 45 minutes and now um, when we're running close to that now, what, is there anything uh, in closing that we, we should we should add to our conversation. I know Merck, you you have um, w written a report on on women's issues, women's rights. Can we talk about that briefly, maybe? And Seth, let's talk about some of the students you've brought as well before I before I let you all go. <laughs> Seth, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> okay. Well, I th I think. Um, when we look at the impact that going to Haiti, we, we, when we go to Haiti with the delegations of students uh, from my, the public high school I work at uh, in, in the South Bay area of California, um, we stay with comrades, Haitian comrades. We don't, you know, we, we're very much integrated over many years of doing this work into the movement. So one of the, the biggest impacts that, that these trips have on, on students is when they see the capacity of people to grassroots, to organize, to, um, to resist, and to build. Um, UNIFA is a wonderful manifestation of what the organized people can build, uh, you know, as part of their resistance to, to the coup and the, the, the regime, but also towards building a new Haiti. There's other examples too, we see with grassroots organizations where youth, um, fellow students, Haitian students serve as role models to, to our students. And when, they, when, when, they, when the US students come back here, they, the bar has been raised for them about what it means to organize, what it means to study, what it means to resist, and what it means to, to, to build. Um, the other thing I would simply add is that we learn a lot when we're in Haiti and before in Haiti and after about the role of the United States government in, in, in making the coup possible in the long history of sabotaging the Haitian Revolution, opposing the Haitian Revolution. Um, 
And most recently, the U.S. government using our taxpayer dollars to fund the Haitian police, which have been linked um, to these, have been involved in, in these horrific massacres, like the La Saline massacre that Merck mentioned earlier. And that's very eye-opening for our students who come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, now in the United States, we're talking about defund the police, but then on the other hand, many of these young people are now aware that the U.S. government is funding the Haitian police that is on the day, on a, a weekly basis, involved in extrajudicial killings of Haitian youth and activists and in horrific massacres. So that has radicalized um, our students for in a very good way to stand up further against the U.S. government and connect the dots that Black Lives Matter from Haiti to the Bay. Well, I think this is a really, really important thing. First of all, I just have to commend you for um, for educating your students in this manner. It's a whole another level of being a teacher and, and education outside of the classroom and actually understanding US history in the hemisphere. And there's so much of what you've shown your students that really makes me think of US foreign policy has now come back, has come home. And, um, and it's so apparent what we're seeing on the streets here in the States, how, our, how this practice overseas is now you know, in our own streets. Also, and really, I love the fact that you say when these USians come back home, I had a conversation on my Facebook page um, and actually remained a conversation in my comment section that somebody, I don't know what I posted, something about a meme of this is the United States, this is America. And people wanted to know, well, what do you call people from the U.S. if all the hemisphere is America? And we say, well, we're U.S.ians or we're from the States. <laughs> it's, so, it's so great. I love yeah. hearing you say when the U.S.ians come back home because it's so true. The whole hemisphere is America, not just, not just one country. Um, Terry, Terry, yeah. this is Pierre. Real quick, before Merck comes along, uh, comes in. I just want to say I forgot a very important friend of Haiti who was on the webinar. And this is a great man, that's actor, filmmaker, Danny Glover, who really gave a powerful presentation as well on the webinar. So um, we love Danny a lot for what he does. So I forgot to mention his name and it just was on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> we all I, love Danny. I, I just think that, you know, to follow up from what Seth said, that and some of what you said i mean i think that actually in terms of in understanding the history of the united states and understanding you know historical denialism which is really important right now because we're having a, a history war about what really happened in the united states that haiti plays such an important role and that in the period of 1804 you know, I think we think to ourselves, there wasn't any relationships, you know, it's just very hard for people to get around and there wasn't, but actually people were coming throughout the Caribbean and to the Atlantic states and going to Latin America. And there was like really burgeoning relationships, intellectual relationships. And so the struggle against enslavement and slave states and plantation capitalism in Haiti actually also came to the U.S. And so I think we, you know, our histories are really intertwined in that sense. And also the history of white supremacy is so intertwined with the people of Haiti. So I think, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, why is the U.S. so interested in Haiti? They're so, you know, and I always answer, well, obviously they are, um, you know, and secondly, you know, it's like when people say that, it's as if, well, that's sort of stupid, but obviously they are very interested in Haiti and they're very interested in all of the Americas because they, but they cannot let an independent Black Republic because it provides such an example to other um, enslaved peoples throughout the Americas. And so I think, you know, when we think about Haiti in that way, and that legacy comes from, you know, the, 17, the 19th century or the 17th century, all the way up to the 21st century. So that's in historical memory. And I think that we really have to think about Haiti in that way. And, and so it has to, you know, for people who are doing Latin America work and for people who are doing work around the Caribbean, a lot of times Haiti is left out of that 
and people forget about it. And we have to, when we're thinking about fighting white supremacy, we have to put that in the picture. When we're well, thinking about it. Black Lives Matter, we have to put Haiti in the picture and think about why hasn't, why hasn't Haiti you know, been so much in the peace movement or around Honduras or Venezuela. Why is it a different example? It's not. It's not. It's an, inter it's an integral part of all. Yeah. Of yeah. All. So I think yeah. that that's a very, you know, I think that's one of the things we have to think about. And, and share more about and, yeah. and have more conversations like this about with all of you. Yeah. Yes. Um, there, one of the things too that's fueling, that's at the, the bedrock, I would say, of the struggle, of the grassroots struggle, of the grassroots movement in Haiti for justice and equality and self-determination, um, is the, the bedrock is tout moun se moun. It means every human being counts. Every human being is somebody. And this is the, the I, not just a slogan, but it encapsulates what, what fueled the movement of our foremothers and forefathers in 1791, August 14th, is actually the, the anniversary of that big uh, Congress of the leadership of the enslaved population. And August 21st was the launch of the massive rebellion that culminated 13 years later in Haiti or 12 or so years later in Haiti becoming an independent nation. And so Tutmun Semun, when you say that in Haiti, and it, it means not only that people are, are of rights as human beings and are entitled to those rights, but people are determined to take those rights. It's not as if they expect someone to give it to them. They know by their history, from the kidnapping in Africa to their struggle for liberation, for independence, and ongoing for economic, justice, social justice, equality, that they have to fight to get it. And that's what's going on today. And so the, the, the university, UNIFA, on that basis of Tutmun Semun, which is President Arisid came up with that, it's saying that everyone, nobody should be excluded from having a good life. All the young people in Haiti should have access to education. All the young people, our men and women, must have access to quality of life, must have access to health care. And that's what's fueling, that's the philosophy of, the, of UNIFA, that's the philosophy of the movement in Haiti, and that's what's fueling the resistance of the Haitian people against oppression and injustice. It's what makes it so beautiful. It, it's tough, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful story with, uh, among beautiful people, and you can really feel it among, among um, Haitians while you're there. And here, too, I will add, in the, in the States. So, Seth, we are approaching the hour, and I promised all of you I would not keep you. <laughs> so I have to say thank you to all of you. Pierre Lavoisier, Seth Donnelly, Judith Merck Merkinson, all of them from the Haiti Action Committee in the San Francisco Bay Area. What an honor to have this conversation with the three of you. And I look forward to, to doing it again. Yeah, and I uh, thank you, Code Pink. Yes, yes. Sure. thank you, Code thank Pink. You. Thank, thank you for you. doing all great work over many years. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, yeah. all of you as well. Doing this together. We're, we're all in it together and, and, the, and the solidarity is just wonderful and the friendships and the work that we all share. It's a really valuable um, relationship and it's very valuable work. And I'm so very thankful uh, for this conversation today. I wanna remind our viewers um, that we broadcast every Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube. And every Thursday, uh, please join us uh, we're presented on uh, Pacifica Radio, WBAI of New York, WPFW out of Washington, D.C., 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 um, a.m. Eastern, every Thursday. So thank you again, all of you. A real honor and pleasure to have this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And watch the webinar. We urge you to yeah. watch it. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I will post that, actually, yeah. for the viewers. I'll right. post that. Um, in the and in our just in our description yeah. great yeah, yeah. okay great. thank All right. you thank you bye. so much bye bye bye